Good evening, folks, and welcome to episode three of the Safe Ed for All show on Socialist Telly. It's a sad consequence of social media that as much as it can be a source for alternative news, as much as it can be a platform for challenging what the mainstream might tell us, as much as it can be a place to campaign and educate, there will always be those seeking to do the complete opposite. Without the internet, without social media to build up a presence on, the likes of Safe Ed for All, for example, would struggle to get heard, to lobby and protest at government actions defying the science. But as much as they exist to protect children by demanding vaccination and mitigation measures be taken, there will be those who desire otherwise, of other apparently parent-led groups campaigning and lobbying against mitigations, anti-mask, anti-vaccination, pro-keeping our kids in school despite risks that seem obvious to us as parents, apparently in defiance of the science. Joining me to discuss the issue of these conflicting campaigns and issues, we have Sarah Saul and Claire Kosler back from Safe Ed for All, Karan Bales, an activist from the National Education Union, and my socialist tele co-host, Bonnie Craven, rounds out the lineup. Welcome one and all. Thank you for your time this evening. How are you all? All good. Good. All things considered. <laughs> All things considered. Well, you can't hope for much better than that, really, can you? <laughs> now, vaccinate and mitigate has been the hashtag of the week, Sarah and Claire. This message from the busy bees at Safe Ed this week. Would you like to give us a, an update, first of all, as to what Safe Ed have been up to over the last week, please? Okay. Do you want me to go, Claire? Go for it. Okay. So, this week so far, since the last show, we've um, sent yet another letter, this time to um, Gavin Williamson, and including people such as Kate Green and um, the Lib Dem Daisy and um, Vic Slodian from the Greens, just anybody who has the remit of education within their um, responsibilities, just asking them, you know, the clock is ticking. Um, schools are going back in Scotland. I think they've got seven or eight days till their schools return. And in the UK, we're on about 23 days, I think, for some schools. Um, and yet we've had no indication that there's going to be any changes in, in actual fact. We have had the indication that a lot of the things that were in place last term won't be there, such as bubbles or isolation or identifying close contacts or anything like that. Um, so clock is ticking we've sent a letter had no response from anybody yet and um, basically asking them to do five things and um i'm trying to remember all the five things now but i think it was asking them to publicly state their support for um monitoring and improving ventilation publicly state their support for not finding parents who would choose to remote educate for whatever their reasons are um, during a global pandemic because the measures that are necessary to contain an airborne infection are not in place. Um, asking them to publicly mention and raise the issue of lunchtime super spreader events, as they're called. You know, they're recognised in the states that a dining hall filled with hundreds of unmasked students while they're eating isn't the sensible way to mitigate the um, spread of airborne virus. Um, I think we've asked them to publicly state that masks are one of the mitigations that are used when indoors in a, mixing with other households. So we've asked them to do some very simple things. We understand not all of them can affect change. Not all of them are Gavin Williamson, which ultimately I think the book stops there for getting these measures done. But if every one of those people named on the letters could stand forward and say, this is what we like, this is what we'd like to happen, maybe we'll get some momentum and change going. In addition to that, obviously, you know that we're part of the Hive with um, some other smaller grassroots campaign groups at the minute. It's Shielders and ourselves who are taking the lead. Um, I think Hazard's campaign are coming on board this week. Um, and we've asked people on Twitter to show, to act collabor collaboratively, to um, work together, to show a bit of a, a support for mitigations and for vaccinate and mitigate rather than vaccinate and infect, which seems the current strategy in the UK. Um, so you'll see a lot of little busy bees going around um, uh, Twitter and you know the hashtag swarm is just showing and highlighting that there is a movement there. There are plenty of us out there who think this is the sensible approach to take rather than the vaccinate and infect. So a few little things going on there. Um, but other than that, I think a lot of the our time is spent at the minute just trying to support parents who are 
for lack of a better word, just feeling despondent. Um, you know, the clock is ticking. They're starting to get their school uniform stuff together. They're starting to have to face that fact of every day sending their children back into an indoor setting that doesn't have adequate mitigation to the airborne virus. We've said it before, no other workplace is allowed to do what schools have been allowed, how schools have been allowed to operate. And um, I think Karam very, very um, succinctly put a thread on Twitter today saying, you know, I think we might as well admit that there isn't anyone coming to save us. The cavalry is not coming. So can all head teachers and, and management teams within schools please look at what they can possibly do without the help from the DFE, because I don't think it's coming. What can you, you know, some simple measures that you can put in place to really do your best to keep everybody in your school community safe. Um, so that's where we're up to. Claire, have you got anything to add to that? Uh, I thought I'd dress as a bee tonight to do the point. Um, no, there's been a lot of very bad bee jokes going, but I, it's just been about trying to get people to actually join in with, you know, the wave of, of, of things. I mean, the other thing we do, I think we're doing a lot of is supporting individual parents or a lot of parents are going through various issues. You know, some have some, some even have like, you know, some separated parents. This has caused massive rifts between them. And they're going through legal cases with schools and with ex-partners. There's a lot of stuff going on. And it's about just being there to support people. We've all got different backgrounds and different expertise. And we tend to just go, oh, right, you know about that. You know about that. You know about that. And it's busy. It's really busy. Mm, yeah. Well... It's no secret that the government have repeatedly failed to lock down in time. To They've delayed lockdowns. They've uh, removed mitigations affecting not just schools, as this show mainly focuses on, but also across society as a whole. The Byline Times have covered the lobbying of a group called Us For Them, who have essentially urged the government to not listen to their scientists and seem to be subscribing to the, the contents of the Great Barrington Declaration, which for anyone who hasn't heard of it, essentially promotes a belief that Herd immunity can be achieved by simply shielding the most vulnerable and letting everyone else catch it. That might sound familiar to some viewers. Now, I understand they'd gone to some lengths, uh, even threatening legal action, a judicial review, if schools were not opened up without mitigations. Um, who are us for them? What is their message and how influential are they? Who wants to start with that? Karam, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, yeah, I might I might as well have that one. Um so, so I first became aware of us for them, like at the very at the very end of May, start start of June, when all of a sudden I saw them being advertised as an advocacy group, and they were getting, I saw them appear in the Telegraph a few times and on the radio on on two different radio programs in the space of like two or three days, and I was I, and I must admit at that point I I was a little bit confused. I was like, wait a minute, I've I spent years working with all sorts of different campaign groups and organizations i know the ones i agree with i also know the ones that i don't agree with uh, and for an organization to have been formed i think that was in may so if you think about how uh safe ed and all of the other campaign groups proper grassroots groups they spend ages working themselves from the bottom don't they it takes ages you build up your members you start contacting people and it takes a really long time to break through into like the mainstream. As for them, on the other hand, exploded straight into the telegraph. How many articles does, does the, the founder get every single like? It's almost a daily column now, isn't mm. it? Um <clears throat> I think this week is all about that. It's all about uh against child vaccination. Um, arguing that that this is the, the thin end of the wedge, and so wanting to deprive parents. Of 16 and 17 year olds for choice mm. as well. It's asked that they're asking why that, that decision as well. Um, considering that the founder also writes for the Conservative Women blog, um, I, I thought that choice and freedom of choice was a very conservative thing. So it does seem to be going against those values as well, doesn't it? Um, but having done some investigation, so they're very well connected, they get they get support from a bloke called Ed Baker, I believe it is, um, who has worked on Boris Johnson's leadership campaign and has worked um, within the Conservative Party and within the, the, the Conservative 
political movements or providing all sorts of support. Um, we know that he's been meeting with MPs and facilitating their organisation. Um, we also know that us of them are getting support from a variety of other organisations, um, including the Heart organisation, which some people may have seen had their personal um, internal chats logged, um, chat logs released onto the internet. Um, and there is all sorts, all sorts of really, really scary thoughts and ideologies going on there. Um, and so it's quite remarkable the, the, the speed at which they've got this. Um, and one point, one point as well, reading through through the logs, and I know, and I'd already known that they did this. Us for them were invited by Robert Halfen to produce um, evidence to part of it to the Education and Select Committee. Um, I believe this was around how original. The first one they did was around the home learning experience as well. So. Um, within the heart chats there's a conversation between between um one of the one of the organizers of that does us for them having a chat about how they worked with the free the the world freedom alliance to produce the evidence for the parliamentary select committee the world freedom alliance are the organization that have been bagging on about nuremberg 2.0 with the that nurse that was struck off that was shouting about hanging oh, nurse she is she she has been working with the world freedom alliance the world freedom alliance were invited to help write the evidence that us for them submitted to the parliamentary select committee so so to allow an organization organizations and these kind of people within there now if we wanted to be charitable with us for them we could say that they are being pulled into this group of organizations that they, they really don't, that they genuinely don't believe that COVID is a threat um, and that, they're, that people have come along, offered them support and the publicity that they want. However, we know that they now know what the other groups that they're involved with are up to. So they can't say we are unwitting partners. They know what the groups are like. If they don't separate, if they don't decide to come out with a formal statement or to move away from these groups, then all it says that they endorse the views of these other groups as well. Um, and that, that will be my, my opening summary of us for them. Yeah. Um, Safe Ed, you've been raising concerns about this group for a while now. I think you first raised concerns about them back in December of last year. Um, how concerned are you now, especially in light of the things that we've learned about them since? And how concerned should parents be about groups like us for them? Yeah, very. I'm very concerned. Um, People like the World Freedom Alliance have also, I believe, been tenuously linked to things like the capital attacks. They're, they're, they're very, very enmeshed with people like QAnon. It, it's a very scary and dark network. And, and, and I'm sure Karen's found as well, the funding of it's very, very um, web-like. Yeah, they've, they've set up as a registered company now. Um, I, I, I did have a look earlier. They've been a registered company since April. So I'm assuming they're getting some funding from somewhere. Yep. Anybody got any ideas where or who? I think it's still used. I, I, I think we're back down the well-worn pathways of where everybody went, oh, goodness, how was Brexit funded? I think that I think the pathways were there. They've just used the same networks. I think a lot of the funding is coming from the same sources. Um especially as people like Candice Owens have been speaking out about things like that as well. And there's a well-worn path of funding sort of via Turning Point USA to Turning Point UK into those conservative networks. I mean, anybody who was around for the whole Brexit thing has seen these networks working in the background and this sort of dark, well, dark funding. And they're just using the same networks. They, they had them there and it's like, whatever they want to do now they have the means to do it and the means to pass it through and make it sound like a perfectly reasonable point of view i think that that's the scary thing it's the normalization of views like this which is frightening mm. Sarah. Sarah? yeah i think um back in december myself and another um safe Ed, um member put together a dossier for nafiz ahmed saying that you know we're not investigative journalists but we have some concerns um, as a real grassroots um, parent-led advocacy and campaign group, how is this possible? How, how do you get a regular column in the Telegraph? How do you get billboard posters? How do you get um, conservative MPs standing up and saying, 
um, protect our children and, you know, support us for them. Keep Do nothing different. It's basically their campaign for education with do nothing different in a global pandemic. Keep education exactly the same. And without accusing anyone, because I'm very aware of how much they like to litigate, mm-hmm. I would just say, if I was a government minister who had decided I was going to pursue the Great Barrington Declaration strategy, as they call it, which is um, take it on the chin, let it run riot. Those who get it, get it. Those who survive, survive. Those who don't, don't. We'll protect, we'll throw a ring of protection around our vulnerable and see how it goes, right? We'll be all done and dusted with it in one big way, over and done with. If I prescribed that, and I knew it was going to be quite a big ask for the rest of society in the UK to all get behind that. What would I do? Well, first of all, I would have a grassroots parents group who claim to be on the side of the children who want to make sure that children are not caught up in these mitigations, you know, pesky mask wearing, heaven forbid, or having to have smaller class sizes or having to have better ventilation in their classrooms because they would be a key component to making sure that, as the Great Barrington Declaration supporters say, those younger, less affected groups need to have the virus and get immunity in order to pursue this strategy. So if I knew that I was going to come up against difficult questions as why I'm not putting mitigations in school, would it be easier to be able to say, well, that's because this group of parents over here said that we shouldn't and, and we children shouldn't be being affected by this pandemic response. Children need to be children. You know, children um, need their education. Schools must remain open. And can I just point out that at no point has Safe Ed said that schools should be closed. Uh, we have always said that schools need to remain open and to use best practice from around the world, put in the mitigations, and in-person education can continue. Um, but this false polarisation then was set up quite easily. So I'm not saying that is what happened. I'm saying if I was in that position of power, that would be my strategy. Let's set up a group that's ready to go, well-funded, well-organised and has the connections in order to get these key messages out there. At the same time, I would also spend over £3 million on an advertising campaign to get children back into school and reassure parents that children are not at any great risk. That did happen. That's not made up. Um, you know, three million pounds that could have been spent on putting in place some of the mitigation, improving remote education, doing a lot of the other things we've we've discussed over and over again. Mm. So if I had now an advertising campaign, a legitimate advertising campaign from the Department of Education saying, Don't worry, children aren't really affected, children don't transmit, and children very rarely get ill. And I also have a campaign group of parents standing up saying, We're prioritizing children and keeping their mental health and and ensuring they can socialize efficiently in school there you go i've set up the polarization and that minimizes anything that us as small grassroots campaigns who were starting at that stage are trying to get our voices heard we're drowned out straight away it's called called safe ed for all not closed schools for all it it, 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 the the name is it's all the description is very much there in the title and i think you're right if you wanted to uh, convince people at home that this is the strategy that's best for their children even though it's completely counterintuitive then you'd want to mount a massive pr campaign essentially and uh karam you mentioned a chap called ed barker earlier on um, he's done PR for Preeti Patel. He's done PR for Michael Fallon. Uh, he did PR for the COVID recovery group, which is the lockdown skeptic group of Tory MPs. This has all been written about by uh, Nappies Ahmed from Byline Times, who you've referenced there as well, Sarah. Uh, it, you know, every, the people that can pull this sort of thing off all seem to be in place. Uh, Bonnie, can I bring you in for a comment? Yeah, well, we're looking again at a case of activists needing to follow the money. It's quite straightforward, isn't it? If um, if there's no transparency in the funding arrangements and who people are serving, then we really have to question whether or not we can trust and rely on what they're saying. We've seen it happen time and again with NHS campaigns, for example, and with campaign groups that were working to prevent the academisation of our schools, which was forced on so many. 
um, often those with the deepest pockets get the loudest voice. And as grassroots activists, we have to be able to get by on a on a shoestring, basically. I mean, what we've done here at Socialist Telly, obviously, is um, you know <laughs> really doing things on a budget and making sure that you get your voice out. But it, it requires the legwork to be successful in any event. So I would really urge anyone watching this to take a close look at the structures the key players in any of these organizations are trying to encourage shall we say parents to make certain decisions about their own uh, safety and the safety of their children um, in the grip of this pandemic it's been perfectly transparent as far as I can see that every time that there's been a holiday from the schools infection rates and deaths have gone down accordingly and obviously at the moment the infection rate is down a little although the, the number of daily deaths seems to fluctuate quite quite vastly um, I'm obviously very concerned actually um, about from the NHS perspective what's going to happen come mid-September when all the schools are back with more parents who perhaps decided to um, deregister their children due to the threats and everything maybe reconsidering whether or not their kids go back into school because because you know, when when more children are back the infections the number of infections are going to go straight up and that's even supposing that there were still some form of bubbles or what have you I, I if I fail to understand any logic to remove the requirement for children to wear face coverings in the classroom. No, I mean, as a trade unionist and an education activist, uh, this group must be of enormous concern to yourself and the National Education Union, Karam. Uh, this kind of messaging undermines any effort to mitigate COVID, which we know is spread most readily in schools, become clearer each day. It seems that kids are on holiday for as these figures currently are going down whilst they're on holiday. I dare say, once schools return in Scotland in about a week's time, we might start to see a little bit of a change there, which would indicate what might come across the rest of the country. But what are your greatest concerns? What, me what measures should be being implemented now in schools whilst they're shut? So I, um, uh, as um, Sarah said earlier, I put out um, basic, basic rules that we need to be following. First of all, masks. Um, the DfE guidance says that nobody can be forced to wear a mask or forced to uh, not wear a mask. So therefore, anybody that doesn't feel safe should be coming in wearing a mask. Um, for a start, anybody who's CV who, or who's a CEV and pregnant women as well, because there's more and more data saying that we really do need to protect anybody in, in pregnancy as well. They should, they should be investing in the best mask possible. In theory, they should be trying, they should be going in and getting individual risk assessments for those. So if it's about protecting the vulnerable, then all of our vulnerable members of staff and any any students for, who are vulnerable themselves or with a vulnerable fam family member should be getting the best quality masks. Now, the price and the availability of those now is completely different to March and April last year. They're very easily available. They're considered very a lot cheaper. If you're if you're a member of staff, then it counts as a work expense if it's in your risk assessment. You can even claim your tax back. Maybe you can get the school to to fund a few masks for 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 vulnerable. Um, staff members so and then the school needs to do, be clear clear on their message we want positive messaging we are a clean air school we want we want our children to come in wearing masks my school's going to be doing this we're going to say we can't make you wear a mask but for the whole community we really do recommend that you do wear a mask um, my head teacher will be walking around the school wearing a mask all the time to, to show that he's taking it seriously he's going to meet the kids at the gates wearing a mask I we can't force people, and that's fair enough at this point, but we can really encourage it. And when masks were removed and my school decided to keep them, 95% of the kids kept their masks on. So we can encourage that. But the quality of masks as well, that's really important. The next thing we need is CO2 monitors. We need to know actually how good is the air quality in our rooms. And see, there's a lot of work on CO2s, how we can use that as a rough, a rough measure. Um, and we can identify some rooms may actually be fine. Some some teachers may be worrying, some parents may be worrying about the ventilation in their classrooms. We put a CO2 monitor in, we never know. Some rooms may be fine. And then we can focus on improving the ventilation on the others. It reduces the cost. See, once again, vulnerable staff members, if they're in a the class, they need the CO2 monitors more than anything else. If their CO2 monitor is displaying a low air change, then they need a different classroom. Head teachers should be looking and union reps should be looking to negotiate classroom swaps. If this room isn't safe, we want a healthy volunteer, please swap around. Um, but then the biggest one is ventilation. 
Now, in America, re I've been reading threads in America on improving school safety, and they say, well, the government's just released billions of pounds of funding. Just go get your funding. And the argument, what they're discussing in, in America is what ventilation units to invest in. What's the quickest way? Shall we invest in quick portable units, stick them in the classroom, and then look at long-term ones? But the money is there. We don't have that. We've got nothing. And we're not going to get that, that. So there are some really good designs. Um, there's one, one called a Corsi Rosenthal cube, and the other one is, the, is created by Ford. So Ford have designed a cheap DIY air filter. And it's just a box fan, an air filtration like layer. You put it on top, you put it on the stand, and they've run it for that. They've, they've sent it off to be formally tested. So there's even studies saying this will reduce the, the level of virus in the air by such amount. It should reduce the risk of infection by that amount, uh, as are the course of, uh, cubes as well. So that, that's what I've come down to. Nobody's coming to save us. We need to do it ourselves. We need a community effort to build DIY air filters and start getting them into schools. We do as much of that as we can now. We try, we try and get as much in as possible. We go, to, we go to our local community businesses. We ask for donations. We school set up crowdfunding. We get as many of these in as possible and hope that, that some of the media will pick up on it and we can embarrass the government into action because this is what they did in one of the areas of Canada earlier on in the year. They didn't get their funding. They, they did a massive community effort to ventilate and they embarrassed the local government into releasing the funding. And that's where we are right now. We need to stop gap up to half term and hope that they change course then. Yeah. Um, really deal with Marcus Rashford at this point. <laughs> or a celebrity person <laughs> go, yeah, we need we need this in schools. Because that seems to be the only thing. Everything is working on this cult of celebrity. And the, it, the only time people get press interest is when somebody famous is involved. And I, I don't... We can't stop. So relying on a celebrity is a pretty depressing way to go to try and Ooh. get some sort. Of, I, I don't. Mm -hmm. I dare say you're not wrong. I mean, Marcus oh. Rashford. He's a, he's a decent guy, isn't he? He's done an awful lot for uh, for kids. Far. It's. It's. I'll, I'll come back onto uh, Marcus Rashford actually in a little bit. But um, you know, I, masks just are are the ultimate no brainer. Really, they should be the first port of call. But the, of course, we've spoken on this program before already about kids being told to remove their masks at the school gates by certain schools. So you've got schools that are adding to the problem, not helping matters. We've mentioned uh, CO2 monitors on here before. Claire, of course, and the 90 pound um, mobile CO2 units that can be brought in to, to check the, the, the standards of classrooms. Um, of course, uh, and again, this is another example of America actually putting us to shame when so often the US, structured such as it is, um, it is usually used as a, held up as an example of what not to do. They are absolutely shaming us at the, right now with this with the moves towards ventilation. It is an obvious thing to be to to be able to clean the air, scrub the air, to keep air circulation at the, at an optimal level, so that you can, you know, <laughs> you're not get, if it's in the room, you're getting it out, and obviously if you've got more air coming, air circulation, you're not going to have it. Uh, Sort of concentrating in any meaningful way and you might actually get to a point where schools are less of a uh, vector of transmission so to speak but it, it's there's absolutely no sign this government have got any intentions of going here right now is there can i just say what i don't understand about the, the air filtration and um, co2 monitor issue is on the basis of everything else this government seems to have done there was a big way to make some money for some fundraisers and um, people who support the Tory government that, you know, they could have done a fantastic job of making some, lining some pockets for people had they have done this. They could have done it from March last year when, you know, schools were temporarily closed um, to all but vulnerable children. What I don't understand is this, this, um, oh, this, complete set against making these improvements. We keep saying it's a legacy benefit for schools. We've all said, we've all sat in classrooms, either many years ago when I was in the classroom myself or when you visited a classroom, and there's that stale air classroom smell after it's been occupied for the full day. You can't get 
away from it. Everyone knows about it. Um, it just doesn't make sense to me that why they didn't take advantage of this point. The only reason to not take advantage would be if they were following the Great Barrington Declaration, which was let's increase infection. Because yep. why would you put something in that would decrease infection and make money at the same time? If, if what you're really wanting is all children to be infected as quickly as possible. And Let's be honest, it, they're normally obsessed with people being at work, you know, with staff being at work. And, oh, goodness, if you installed ventilation, you'd probably have less staff absence as well, wouldn't you? Because the viruses wouldn't be going round and round the classroom and the children wouldn't be off, which means their parents could be at work as good Tories like you to be. So it would be a win-win situation. And like you said, they could pass it to their friends. I mean, I was really shocked the first summer. I thought, well, the government will spend the summer putting up like porter cabins and, you know, spacing out and arranging with community venues. I'm, I, I, I'm a trustee of a community venue. We were, we were really prepared for local schools because we're right near a school to come to us and say, we would have given them the space for nothing, for nothing, just nothing, no action whatsoever. And I think that was the most stunning thing at that point in time, which is where I think a lot of us went, this is insane. There must be other people that think like us, which is where we began to find each other. I mean, you could, they, they can always find money for things that they want. They can find mm. money for a royal yacht. They can find money for a, uh, a Tory donor who they've given a nice cushy uh, NHS position to, um, who, who might, be, might have just announced today that she might be stepping down from it. Oh. That's a little bit of good news. Uh, Bonnie, do you want to come in and comment? Yeah, I mean, I think that this attitude towards the safety and well-being of our children speaks to a very 20th century attitude towards children generally in this country, which I think is wholly unhealthy. This whole children must be seen and not heard. If you travel around other countries, families go out for meals together. They don't get babysitters in to watch the kids. They're part of a family unit. They're central to the community. Whereas in this country, there's all too much emphasis on trying to make children cause problems or you know they need to be sort of treated as second or third class citizens to compared to adults so I think whilst I agree with you on the points of um, why haven't they been making money for their friends I think many of them perhaps because of the circumstances of their own childhood don't value um, the worth of children full stop and I think that this demonstrates exactly what I've been banging on about for a long, long time as a trade unionist. It's absolutely high time we had formalised uh, parents unions so that we can work in association with our teachers to ensure that our children get a fair shot at life. Because at the moment, what's important to them is just utterly, utterly disregarded. Schools become nothing but free childcare so that people can go out and be exploited on zero hour contracts and things like that. It is no longer about delivering children the education that they need and deserve to become useful citizens of the world when they become adults, because the only useful citizens really we want are the ones that have gone to public school already. So it's just entrenching that class system for us. And, and we really, as parents and educators, we really do need to get our stuff together and stand together to make sure that every child's life is properly valued. Yeah. Now, Mike Buckley from Byline News, who sadly hasn't been able to make it tonight, please do uh, get well soon, Mike, uh, wrote an article back in May titled COVID variants demand stronger safety measures for our children, outlining uh, the concerns regarding the fact children who do become ill do become sick, the weakness in our response to dealing with COVID and highlighting the work done by the group Long COVID Kids. We're now seeing other countries, even the US, as I've just mentioned, taking the decision to vaccinate kids over 12. And I think we're looking at going to uh, vaccinate children over five before too much longer. And here we are in this country, only just now considering vaccinating 16 and 17 year olds. Is the government, I don't know the word, are the, are the government being dragged a little bit in the right direction finally? Or is this just to uh, appease critics and are anti-mitigation groups like us for them and their backers so entrenched that this sort of thing is, uh, is the best we can kind of hope for? Or are they slowly it's being placating. beaten and am I being a bit pessimistic about it? I think it's placating because 16 and 17 year olds can consent themselves. So technically they couldn't stop them. Even if your mother was the biggest us for them activist in the world as a 16 year old, you can consent your own medical treatment. So there would be nothing they could do to stop them doing it. 
Well, other than but, accessing it. Yeah, but chi- but but it's this attitude of treating children, like Bonnie was saying, as children in the very Victorian sense of the word, which is you know you take all your responsibility away from them. They have no say in what happens to them. This very um, sort of Victorian classroom sense of things which means that you know they they couldn't possibly think a 12 or a 13 or a 14 year old could want to be vaccinated or make that decision for themselves yeah. but we're behind the curveball i mean we once once upon a time i mean i know with caveats our, our history isn't stupendous we were a country who were a bit ahead of the trend it almost seems like we're being dragged kicking and screaming these days you know they only do things when they absolutely have to because there might be too many you know, dead bodies on the streets. It, you know, I, I, I would say what's happened to this country, but I do know the answer to that. And it's called the Tory party. <laughs> Does anybody else want to come in? Sarah? I'd, I would just like to say something that Bonnie has highlighted and highlighted last week and has highlighted again, this almost Victorian attitude towards children, which does still exist. And, you know, COVID made it even more perfect because they all had to be seated in rows facing forward. I thought we'd moved on from that you know, clearly not. Um, but this attitude that treating children as though they're separate from the communities they live in and reside in. Now, I've got my own suspicions that some people who may come up with these ideas are the type of people who left their home at a certain age and lived in a certain community, boarding school or whatever, for a while and didn't come home each evening to a very diverse household and live in a community um, where you're interacting with lots of different people and and your household is so maybe that is where this idea of children being separate comes from and and maybe that is something that we can keep challenging on do you understand how schools and school children and families in the rest of society actually work you know they all you know a lot of children over the age of 14 have part-time jobs as well so they're interacting even further in the community whether it's delivering a newspaper or working in the corner shop or whatever else they're doing so can we stop treating children as if they're not part of our community? Because they are. And we've seen it, as Bonnie's had said again, and as Deepti has um, highlighted in Independence Age, and a lot of other members of Independence Age have, that as infection rates, as schools close, infection rates go down. People keep saying that it's nothing to do with schools. Schools don't affect infection rates. Of course they do. You know, we've had the argument that Schools are safe and it's just the parents mixing at the school gates and everything. But it's all the other interactions that go with having a child going out daily for six hours to school and coming home to a diverse, multi-generational household that has been interacting with other members of society. We can't treat them as separate entities. We need to protect them in the same way that I'm protected. When I go into my office, I have a, a new air purifier in the office. We have checked our ventilation. We, we have this... I don't know. The air purification is a big minefield for a lot of people, and I'm not advocating one particular thing over another, but it costs us a thousand pounds for our office. You know, it, it wasn't an extortionate amount for a business to have to pay out to make sure that I'm keeping my staff safe. So if I have to do it to be able to have my staff protected, why aren't schools being forced to do it? You know, why aren't they being given the funds and forced to do it? Um, you know, the money that was um earmarked in Scotland for ventilation. I know that Long COVID Kids Scotland has been doing some freedom of information requests to see how that money's being spent. There are some good examples, but there are also, it wasn't ring fenced for ventilation. So it was announced as this 40 million, or I can't even remember the figure, was going to be given to schools to improve ventilation. And yet it wasn't ring fenced. So the local authorities spent it how they saw fit and the freedom of information coming out of the, the authorities in Scotland has shown that not all of these come from ventilation. They may have spent a couple of thousand here and there on a CO2 monitor, but very little else. So we need the same to happen here. We need the funding for the schools. It, whether it's going to happen in the next 23 days with a massive announcement, I very much doubt it. But as Karan said, in the meantime, every school leader, every school leadership team, every multi-academy trust business manager Every estate manager for school should be looking at themselves very, very closely because if they're not doing everything they possibly can do within the budgets and constraints they have to make sure that infection is controlled in schools, there will be legal challenges and they will take help where it's offered because I know a lot of parents have offered, they've said, Look, 
we'll fundraise, we'll crowdfund, we'll get them. And there's been quite a few head teachers who've gone, no, we don't need you, go away. You know, they wouldn't reject you raising the money for a new roof. There's obviously a political slant to this where you wouldn't want nice clean air in your classrooms. There, there's, there's something else going on. I mean, as karam has been saying, but, you know, take help where it's offered. You know, if, you know, if local businesses want to sponsor it, if the government is not going to shell out, like you said, the cavalry is not coming, school's going to need to take, take help where, you know, there might be parents who offer, there might be businesses who offer, there might be other people in the community who go, we have this spare ventilation unit. We're just going to have to do what we can, but it's shameful. I think it's like uh, it's been said in, in, in previous weeks, they, uh, they worry for their own funding and they worry that if they upset the apple cart too much, then the, uh, the government, as vengeful as it is, um, may, may decide to uh, punish them financially, which they can ill afford. Um, it, it's not looking particularly positive going forwards towards September. As Sarah said, we're looking at some 23 days before uh, most schools in the UK have gone back and Scotland, of course, go back before then. But going forward, if the government continue to, to listen to anti-mitigation advocates like us for them, instead of listening to scientific analysis and parents groups like Safe Ed, I mean, the, the government, they love to say they're following the science. You get Johnson at his podium, flanked by Witty and Valance, but surely they're either following the science or they're listening to groups like us for them. They can't be doing both, can they? Yeah. Um. It depends on well. At the at the end of the day, we've got we've got an issue of uh, rival experts, isn't it? So as long as you can find, uh, it, it's a matter of who do you listen to. So so for instance, on on long COVID, in in the space of a week, we have a report put out by the the paediatricians from Public Health England that said that long COVID was incredibly rare and wasn't an issue, and a lot of that was based on like antibody testing via um, and symptom tracking. That was it. There's the Zoe app, wasn't it? So, so long, long COVID is incredibly rare. It's it's not really an issue. Don't worry about it. And that got headline that made the headlines in every news provider, every single bulletin on certain on certain radio programs. It was on there. It was on front page of newspapers. Um, on the on some of the international work groups I'm in, it has gone like wildfire through certain through certain countries. So, for instance, in Denmark where they are now announcing in the removal of, of isolation for contacts and heading towards us, that, that's front and centre, that's been front and centre as well. However, two days later, or even maybe even a day later, BONS released their data on lung COVID, saying that there are uh, thousands and thousands, I think 34,000 children currently suffering with lung COVID. Mm. The, the people that wrote, the, so now, now there's people with, the, here's our ONS data, here's the Zoe data, which, which set of information do, do you want to choose? Um, most people that I know would say that the ONS was a better source and matches previous ONS data. Mm. However, that long COVID one, so the, pe the people that are supporting that are saying that the ONS isn't reliable. The ONS, when it comes to long COVID, isn't a reliable way and their methods are better. Um, and so this is, this is where you get to. Also, one of the paediatricians that, that wrote that has also today um, made a statement that he believes that alpha is less harmful to children. So, sorry, delta is less harmful to children than alpha. And that all of the stuff that we're getting out of the United States and what we're getting out of Indonesia is all a misunderstanding of statistics. At the end of the day, according to him, only one in 200 children infected will end up in hospital. Did That's you see fine. the BBC report as well that said, uh, we wonder, it was a big, long BBC report report and it, it said well basically we actually uh and you can see them setting it up because they're going to refuse children dla uh we wonder whether it's all psychosomatic and it, like anybody who has a chronic illness goes here we go again because you know they they've done that with me they've done that with fibromyalgia they've done that with all sorts of things and you could see that they were they were beginning to make that approach you know if you have one report here that says it doesn't exist and another one that says it's psychosomatic are they setting it up for when the parents go look i need some help they're going to go no you can't have any i just you, you just know it's going to come We've already had that. Um, a couple of months ago, there was um, an article suggesting that there's been a massive increase in Munchausen by proxy. Oh, I saw that, yeah. Saying that. Oh. I find this quite interesting because that was one of the things that I found when I, when I was looking through the heart groups, chat logs. There was even 
a conversation within there about labeling uh, long COVID Munchausen by proxy, or maybe we need to come up with another name of it. But we that, that appeared about that appeared before, and uh, then a short period of time later, all of a sudden we get these articles coming out. Oh, it's all psychosomatic, it's Munchausen by proxy. <laughs> so either this group has fed into the media narrative, or the people that have fed them the story have fed in. But you can, it's, it's interesting, you can look through the information groups and you can see how the media lines be, are getting developed over time. Sure. Yeah. There's can a, I, a health can I just come or, back to... Um, sorry, go on, Sarah. I was going to say, I can just come back to the Great Barrington Declaration and the video, which I'll share again on, on my Twitter feed and on Safe Edge feed. There's a, a long um, video of the making of the Great Barrington Declaration, which is their video, right? So they think there's nothing wrong with this video. Um, so I'm not saying anything wrong in releasing it. It's not a, a, um, some kind of um, outing them. They made the video. And at one point in it, Jay Bhattacharya says, um, explains that it's fine for teachers to get COVID because most of them won't die. And Sinekta Gupta wonders aloud on the video why teachers wouldn't accept the risk of death in order to serve their students. That is the thinking behind people who believe in the Great Barrington Declaration. People like us for them. That is their thinking. They polarise the debate. They demonise teachers. They demonise them when it was remote teaching, saying they were going to film the quality of their, their remote education their children were getting and going to out to these teachers and, and you know, sat at home doing nothing and doing the bare minimum for their children. They've done a lot of that kind of teacher bashing as well. And mm. um, you know that Safe Ed, we support teachers who are having to go into unsafe workplaces and have had to. I know that a lot of teachers now will have double vaccines, but it doesn't mean that they can't contract. It doesn't mean that everyone's safe. You still need mitigation for the vaccination. But if you, I'll, I'll share that again today. If you have the time to watch that video and, and to see some of the things they say, how anyone in our society can support that kind of strategy is beyond belief to me. But none of them would actually do it. They're, they're very happy for other people to go out and die on their behalf, whether they're children or teaching staff or parents. But they know that by privilege and position, it's never actually going to happen to them. The logic of suggesting that teachers ought to be prepared to take the virus to save their children from catching it is so unbelievably warped. Every teacher who catches COVID is going to be in front of upwards of you know 40 60 pupils each day so they are guaranteed to be super spreaders it's completely crazy uh well there's no logic there at all is there it, it makes no sense i mean there's a story out today in the mirror saying about how uh, class sizes have grown getting bigger and bigger and bigger across the country uh, some 150,000 children are in now in bigger class sizes. So, yeah, sure, let the teachers catch it. That's even more children in some areas, like Swindon, um, I think was meant. Well, they cut schools, didn't they? I mean, they cut schools in the period where the population started going down. Around the time my son was born eight years ago, there was a mini explosion, and that's now reflect. It carried on after that, and now it's reflecting in schools. Mm -hmm. But they took the places away, so there's no places for the children. So that's the only thing they can do now. Yeah, well, for a group that professes to have so much concern for the welfare and well-being of children, I've had, I've had a bit of a look around today, and I can't see much talk about them talking about child poverty. I can't see much talk about uh, homelessness and housing issues and crises for families. I can't see much about um, right to food, which, of course, we were talking about Marcus Rashford earlier, and that was his campaign. Um, a, a cynic... Uh, and I am one for most of the time, might say this group is all about politics, ideology, and not about genuine issues surrounding children. So if so, what is their end game here? And has it ever actually been about kids? Well, you notice that hardly any of the MPs actually sit in the chamber themselves. So they're expecting our children to be braver than they are in their own roles that they're paid very handsome salaries for. Yeah, isn't it just? But it, it just strikes me, if, if, if you, you, you're you arguing like you are, as, as this group, for saying, oh, you don't, the risks to children are non-existent, they're uh, perfectly fine for them to go to school, they don't need masks, they don't need social distancing. What are they trying to achieve here? 
Because it's not going to get rid of the virus in any meaningful way. Yeah. It's not going to mitigate it in any meaningful way in schools. There's still going to be absolute breeding grounds for this virus and will be again from September if the government continue to do nothing in the meantime. What is their end goal, do you think? Surely if, well, surely if you actually cared about the welfare of children, one, you would have been canvassing what children actually think about all this. And two, you would have been going, oh, the children are having a really bad time. Why don't we, you know, with all the money we've got and the influence we've got, set up forest schools so they don't get terribly lonely. And we're worried about if they really were worried about the children's mental health, they would have done something about it. I mean, it's the fact that, you know, it's just about it's all it's all about bums on seats, children's bums on seats. So parents bums can be at work that that's all it's about you know it's about whether they as office landlords are getting the rent paid at the end of the day it's all about maintaining that status quo and if a few of us die they're not bothered are they i agree with all you've said claire but i i also think that coming into play is the the great barrington declaration yes strategy because yeah. I cannot find, as you've said, all those things, if they really do care for the welfare of children. When there was, were, when schools had to move to remote education for January up until the 8th of March, they had to move to remote education because the infection rate was so high, because our NHS you know, has a limited number of, of um, ICU beds, whether that's paediatric ICU beds or others, they, they knew they were getting close. Um, so remote ed was the way to go. If if their real goal was the mental health and support and trying to keep things as natural and as normal through this terrible pandemic for children, they would have done all the things you said. However, they didn't. And equally, they're pushing. I know I've had a doctor today to me, Dr. Katie Musgrove, I'll name her, on um, Twitter, tell me that my asthmatic child will be mostly, probably be fine circulating in school with a virus circulating. Mostly, probably. Mostly, probably fine. Yes, but mm. no words, not mine. Go look at it on Twitter. Um, yeah. And and that um, I should, we should take the masks off and stop being so neurotic, basically. You know, this is a GP who's supporting us for them. And, and the reason why I ended up commenting was she, she's promoting us for them's mentality and mm. herd, herd immunity via infection thing. And I'm like, I can't believe you're saying that. Every, every piece of research that's coming out at the minute is saying that you're not, not achieving immunity by having infections there's no there's no great way that everybody who's been affected will not get infected again and will not have any lasting effects that's not what the research is finding at the minute um you know what this has actually brought up me as well i you know i seriously wonder you know sometimes when you see the doctors who are spouting this stuff and the teach there are some teachers who spout it who is going into medicine who is going into teaching i mean when i went into teaching which is like 30 something years ago I did it because I liked children I did it because I cared about society and I wanted to make things better and you seriously get the impression that a lot of these gone in it well maybe not so much teaching because you don't really make a fortune unless mm, academies maybe but for the paycheck and so they don't think about these things. And something like the Great Barrington Declaration makes perfect sense to them. They're like, oh, well, herd immunity, end of. Not thinking for one moment that somebody they know they could die, could die, or one of their children could die. It's always somebody else, isn't it, with these people? You know, it's somebody else's children. Some, like somebody else can sweep the streets and somebody else's children can die, but not mine. Karam, would you like to make the uh, final point tonight? We're almost out of our time. Is there anything you would like to add to that? Um, free, free education stories that have not that have not been covered by us or them or most of the most of the press that have been supporting them. A um, uh, three hundred million pound fund for children's mental health in primary schools was cut last week. Three hundred million pounds of of mental health funding gone. We have the stealth cuts to people premium. So our disadvantaged peoples, hundreds of millions gone, um, and there is there is a fast tracking um, a, um, a review of children's social care services um, without consulting with any of the charities involved as they continue to privatise the system, handing it over the care homes for the most vulnerable children to private investors. Private, I have run a story on it this week. Um, if education was a priority, 
people would also be speaking about those issues. There is so much disinformation going on out there, and there are so much, uh, in so many important stories, such as those you've just outlined, that are getting no pickup at all whatsoever. Um, our media should be ashamed of themselves, quite frankly, but it's entirely typical when they're uh, so entrenched and uh, in hock to the government we sadly have at this moment in time. Thank you very much once again to all my guests tonight for the Safe Ed for All show. Thank you very much to uh, Safe Ed, Sarah, and Claire once more for joining us thank you very much karam for your time this evening it's been uh, a great pleasure to have you on sir uh, and bonnie it's always a pleasure to have you on take care always folks. a we'll pleasure see you to again be next. Thanks, <laughs> okay. take care we'll be back again for another